We're in the second part of the new series that we uh, started last week. And as of last week, I didn't really have a title for the series, and we talked a little bit about why. Rebecca fortunately came up with one, and she put it up with the Facebook uh, post of the message. We're going to call this Parables from Taekwondo, because why not? And if you remember where we arrived last week is that um, there is a difference in a relationship between the spiritual disciplines of our Christian faith and the values of our faith and the, the moral expectations of our faith and the overarching way of Christ. They're connected in that the disciplines and the values and the expectations are intended to draw us into the presence of Christ so that we can experience His love, His grace, and be transformed into the image of Christ, which is, or the way, which is love, compassion, justice, peace, mercy. All of those overarching qualities that Jesus uh, exemplified in the world is the way that we are called to live into. And they have a relationship between another, that they kind of feed each other, that the disciplines and the... uh, the attitudes, the values, as they draw us into relationship with Christ and transform us from the inside out more into this image of love and justice and peace and compassion of Jesus, that drives us back to desire more of those disciplines and those values and those attitudes, which points us back to Jesus, with, and it just continues to feed upon itself, and hopefully we become in the process more like Christ in the way that we are both internally and the way we act externally on the world. But we also noticed that just because somebody is doing the things, is doing the checklist, doesn't mean that they're also cultivating that way within them. That sometimes Christianity can trick us into thinking that we have a list of things that we have to check off in terms of behavior and attitude and how much we go to church and how much we pray And that's what it means to be a good Christian and forget that there's a whole lot more to it that we're supposed to embody. And that, in fact, if we miss the jump from one to the other, those disciplines can actually create in us a judgmental spirit or an angry spirit uh, or, or an unforgiving spirit, which causes us to not embody the way of Christ. And what this tells us is something really important. It tells us that becoming more like Christ doesn't happen by accident. It's not something we just fall into. It's not like all of a sudden the Holy Spirit decides and says, hey, I'm going to whammy so-and-so right now and make them just like Jesus. It's not the way it works. Our faith to grow and deepen takes a sense of intentionality and purpose. Because the world is trying to draw us away from all of this stuff. The temptations are all over the place. And what happens if we're not aware of those temptations? We fall into them, right? If we're not aware of what is trying to twist us away from the way of Christ, it's much easier to feed into it. And so in order for us to cultivate the connection between what we do and who we are called to be in the image of Christ there has to be purpose. And so what we're going to look at today is a discipline that is essential in helping us make the connection and drawing us into this relationship with Christ. And that discipline is a discipline of meditation. Now, do any of you have a weird association with the term meditation? When you hear meditation, do any of you picture somebody in a weird orange robe sitting cross-legged and floating in the air? Okay? Christianity has had a very strange relationship with this word meditation. And I'm going to give you a little bit of the history about why that is, because if if we have any baggage associated with it, it's good to address that before we move move on. Um, Because meditation is actually a discipline that has existed in Christianity from the beginning. In fact, we even see all the way back in Psalms, what does it say they're supposed to do? Meditate right? But part of the reason meditation has gotten this weird rap amongst Christians is because in the the early and even bleeding into the mid-1900s, 
there was this kind of surge of Eastern philosophy that started to come into the country. There were people coming in from Asia that brought with them their different uh, understandings of philosophy. There are Buddhists and other, you know, yoga and the kind of different kinds of yoga and all the philosophy that goes behind that. And they were coming into America. Now, how many of you think that the Americans thought that they were strange? How do we usually deal with strange? They freaked out, <laughs> right? This is bad. This is wrong. This is evil. It's not like what we're doing, and so this is bad. Now, most of the folks that came over, while we wouldn't agree with them, were not necessarily intending anything bad, but you did have some that came over and took their perspective and formed cults with it and wound up preying upon the people that they brought into their particular cult. And as happens, the cults got exposed and put into the news. And as soon as the cults went into the news, Christians looked at this and said, see, we told you this was evil. We told you this was bad. And anything associated with it also becomes bad, becomes demonic. And so meditation becomes this negative thing that Christians aren't supposed to do. Well, I'm going to suggest that we've never stopped doing it. We just call it different things. And we're going to look at some of those things today because they are essential. In terms of this term meditation, though, all meditation is is focusing your mind and spirit. That's it. So is the issue meditation or is the issue what we meditate on? It's what we meditate on. It's what we focus on mind and spirit. And if we can get an understanding of this, it can be a great help in hearing God and understanding God and in developing our faith. Um, when I went out into Colorado, we spent a good amount of time talking about meditation and understanding the nature of it. Um, and really playing with it a little bit because one of the things that there's even some Christians today that say, I don't want to mess with that martial arts stuff because that's a bunch of Eastern mojo and meditation and that's just going to make people the devil. And I'm hoping we dispelled that last week pretty handily with, uh, with the message about the way. Um, and my hope is that you'll get a little comfortable with this concept this morning because you didn't know it when you came in today, but we're going to be very interactive. Now, before we get into what we're going to get into, um, there's only really one way we can experience this this morning because of numbers and space, and that's kind of sitting on your behinds and your pews, right? Uh, how many of you, if someone said, I want you to sit cross-legged with your eyes closed for 25 minutes, for how many of you does that sound like torture? Okay? That does not sound good to a lot. Some people, they love it. Other people, it's like, are you out of your mind? I'm either going to fall asleep or, or, or fidget or there's no way I can do that. And that's fine. Because this is, again, one of the misconceptions about meditation. We have this image of the guy meditating and floating and going, oh, but that's not necessarily what meditation is. For example, you can meditate while you are fly fishing. You can meditate while you're driving. You can meditate while you're cooking. You can meditate while you're painting a picture or a wall. You can meditate while you're walking or running. You can meditate laying down, standing up. Meditation is just about finding the process that helps us kind of fall away from ourselves and be able to concentrate and focus. And that looks different for all of us. So don't be tricked into thinking what we're about to do this morning is everything there is to meditation. It's as individual and unique as we are. Um, but we're going to experience a few things, and we are going to tie them biblically because that's what we do, right? Um, and see how these practices are very, very interwoven into the essence of what it means to find, hear, and listen to the voice of God. So I'm going to ask you to do something. How many of you have ever heard of belly breathing? A couple of you, okay. Here's your quick crash course. There's throat breathing, and that sounds like a panting dog, and it's not a very effective way to breathe. There's chest breathing, 
where you puff up here. Now, where do you usually see people chest breathing? When they're out of breath or when they're angry. <sighs> right? That pouting, cranky kind of a breath. Belly breathing is when you breathe in and your stomach goes out. You breathe out and your stomach goes in. I warned the first, uh, the first service, don't do this in a mirror because on the in-breath, you're going to think you have to lose more weight than you actually do. Um, they call this also breathing from the diaphragm. And what's really interesting is if you watch people sing, all right, and if you're in the choir, just be aware that you may get creeped out the next time you sing because people will be watching, is that you rarely see someone singing powerfully breathing up here. You don't see their shoulders move at all. But if you watch their bellies, their bellies are going boop, 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 boop. Um, and it's kind of cool. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to belly breathe. We're going to belly breathe for 60 seconds. Okay? And I want you to inhale through your nose, out through your mouth, and I want you to inhale for a four count, and out for a six count. Now, what's the only way you can be sure you're inhaling for a four and out with a six? You got to count, <laughs> all right? So, you're going to close your eyes, and that's all I want you to do, is I want you to breathe as I've asked you to, and I want you to, in your head, do your four count and do your six count. I'm not going to ask you to do it with me because I might count faster or slower than you. And if I count slower, you're going to feel like you're suffocating. So, each of their own. I even brought out my stopwatch, which isn't a watch at all. All right, close your eyes and begin. And come on back. Anybody almost fall asleep? This is dangerous to do in the morning. Okay. Some of you might feel a little bit more relaxed than you did 60 seconds ago. Some of you might feel a little more clear-minded than you did 60 seconds ago. Most of us have actually told people to do this. We've told them to meditate when they're upset. Because what do we say? Take a deep breath. Count to ten right? Because what we're trying to do is get their brain to interrupt itself. We're trying to get the brain to interrupt itself and get back on track. So we tell people to do this all the time. We just don't call it meditation. But the process of taking time to breathe, to settle, some people call it centering. Like I said, Christians will call it anything but meditation, but we do it and it's necessary, and it's necessary because of what we read in Kings about Elijah. Elijah knew God was coming, right? He's in a cave. He experiences three natural disasters. Now, how many of you ever thought about it that way? He experiences a tornado, a wildfire, and an earthquake, all at one after the other. That is not a calm experience, but it tells us that God wasn't in any of all that ruckus and noise. God was in the silence. Bless you. God was in the still, right? And we read that and we think, oh, it's the still, small voice. Very good. Very true. But what about the earthquake and the fire and the wind? I would wager that if someone had a conversation with Elijah, because he's human, and said, 
Where was God? And, God, he, and, and Elijah says, well, God was in the silence afterwards. And he said, well, are you sure? He might say, well, I'm pretty sure, but to be honest with you, if God was in the rest of that stuff, I'd have never heard God anyway because it was too loud and I was too scared. That ruckus, it's clutter, it's noise, right? And we don't have to have fire, earthquake, and tornado to experience clutter and noise in our minds and in our spirits. Our heads are filled with noise and filled with clutter. Our world is designed to clutter up our brains and to cause our spirits to go all over the place. We can't go anywhere without having somebody try to get our attention. We can't turn on a TV. We're pushing into an election year, and it's like fear is everywhere. Be afraid. Be afraid. Some boogeyman on somebody's side is trying to get you. All of that is clutter. It's noise. Give you well. That. That's clutter. Right? Because, I mean, some people, every time you turn around, it's ding, 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 ding. We have a desire. We have an urge. We want to figure something out. We don't have to wait anymore. We don't have to find an encyclopedia. What do we do? There it is. We don't have to have any downtime if we don't want it. Noise, 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 noise. And sometimes we get in this place where we're saying, God, where is your voice? I can't hear you. Lord, I'm asking. I can't hear you. And the question God is, saying, is asking us is, have you taken time to listen? Are you quieting all the noise inside? And this noise is our agendas and our ambitions. So it's not necessarily even bad stuff. Sometimes we're focused on celebrations and victories and successes. Other times it's confusion and questions and, and not knowing where to head when we're in a crossroads in life and big decisions we have to make that are weighing us down. And all of it can get in the way of hearing what God is trying to speak to us. And so this idea of taking time to breathe, to calm, to push that stuff out, to make room to hear the voice of God, to find the silence where we can hear God speak, to be like Elijah and seek that place where we can hear the whisper. It's necessary just to hear the voice of God. Here's our next one. You're experts on belly breathing now, okay? So now what I want you to do is this. In a moment, I'm going to ask you to dial in on a moment, experience, person, incident, circumstance in your life where you have felt the presence and the glory of God beyond question. It's that mo those moments that nobody can take away from you because you felt it yourself. And again, that's as unique and individual as every one of us. Some people, it may be in an act of giving. Some people will be when somebody did something compassionate for you. It's you being served or you doing the serving. It's compassion given. It's compassion received. It's a worship experience that spoke to you in a powerful way. It's a relationship that came through and demonstrated the goodness and the glory of God as God used them as an instrument. It can be sitting on a beach and looking out at the beautiful ocean and just having a moment where you're embracing the Creator and you feel the Creator embrace you. It can be anything like that. But I want you to zone in on that moment. And I want you to take the next 60 seconds and I want you to just play it over and over and see if you can cultivate some sense of what that means and meant for you as a person being in the presence of God. Okay? Now close your eyes and think about God now.
Now, my hope is that contemplating on that for a mere 60 seconds has given you some sense of reassurance that God is at work in your life and has given you a, rem a remembering of what it feels like when the things of the world seem right with God. But there's more to it than that because on the surface it could seem like, like what I was doing with the kids up here this morning, which is I'm going to think positively and therefore I'm going to feel positively. I will think about a warm fuzzy and therefore I will have a warm fuzzy feeling. But that's not where we're going with this. Because what does Paul say in Philippians? To think on what? Think on whatever is good, whatever is true, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely. Occupy your thoughts. Meditate on the good things, specifically the good things of God. Let those turn over in who you are. Let them be that assurance and inspiration. Because it's in those moments where we feel like we're lost and abandoned that we have to be able to go back and to really embrace that sense of the reality of God. And these are the experiences, these are the moments that remind us that God is still at work in the world, that God has not left us high and dry, that God is imminent, that God is with us, that the Holy Spirit is within us, and we know it because we've experienced it. This kind of reflection is essential for assurance and hope, especially when the world seems like it's going kind of nuts. Because sometimes, I don't know about you, but I think about my values and I think about the way I see the world and how different it seems to be than so many of the other things that I wonder if I'm the crazy one. And I have to go back in and ask, what's up here, God? And go back into those moments where I know that I know because I've experienced it in real time and in my heart. We all need those moments as anchors for our faith so that when things go haywire, we don't get tossed around like a ship without one. If you remember, a couple years ago, we talked about Mary in the Christmas story. And what did she do with the memories of the visiting from the Magi and the shepherds. Stored them as treasures in her heart, right? These memories were so dear to her, so revealing to her of who her son was, that she didn't just say, oh, well, that's nice, but she took them captive. She treasured them. These were gems that she kept. What do we do with treasure? We protect it, right? Right? We hang on to it because it's something that's valuable and dear to us. And what that does for us when it's experiences of God and faith is we can go back in there and let them re-inspire us all over again and give us the hope that comes from knowing what we know. It's what no one can remove from your experience because it's your experience. But we have to be intentional about two things. Number one, taking note about when they happen. Number two, not letting them go. And part of how we do that is through contemplating, reflection, meditating on them. So we see that Elijah shows us that we need to find that stillness so we can hear the small voice. We find that Paul reminds us of what we are supposed to contemplate on, and so we remember the goodness and the glory of God as we've experienced it in our life and allow that to be a source of hope. Last one. This time, I'm going to ask you to imagine or dial in on who you believe God is calling you to be. What is God calling you to down the road? Whether it's a day or a week or a month or a year, has God been calling to you some, to some kind of transformation that you're struggling with? Is God calling you to deepen a path that you're already on? Is there a question that you need answered and you're looking for God's guidance? Where do you see your family, your community headed right now? What is God calling you to in terms of your role to exert the light of Christ within those circumstances and experiences? Everyone's different. We're all going to have a different focus. Let me ask you one more time. Try not to fall asleep. Close your eyes. And let your mind and your spirit focus there.
All right. So the question is, what is the value in doing what I just asked you to do? Because some people might say, well, that's just dreaming, or that's just hoping, or that's just wishing. It's not. None of this is hocus pocus. The first is clarity so we can hear. The second is inspiration so we can continue and forge ahead. We have another word for what we just did. It's called visioning, right? That's what visioning is. It's asking the question, God, what do you want from me? Where do you want me to go? How many of you know that two years ago as we were trying to figure out what was going to happen when that building got done that we spent a lot of time as a congregation visioning? Visioning is a process. It's something that happens in the presence and in concert with God, but it only happens if it's intentionally focused on God. I'm going to argue that visioning actually requires the first two because if we're visioning and trying to hear what God is saying to us, we can't do that until we push ourselves aside and actually are open to God's voice. And we're not going to go to God with that question unless we are assured that God is present and God is going to respond. And that comes from knowing from past experience that God is continually present and speaking. And here's a biblical sense of this visioning. I love this story because it's really strange. The story of Peter on the rooftop. I mean, have you thought about that? This dude's up there praying and he's got a stomach ache because he hasn't eaten for a while. And then all of a sudden, what's he see from heaven? A giant sheet with a whole bunch of weird animals in it. Falling and poof, that's what he sees. And he hears God say, have some dinner, Pete. And Peter says back to him, nothing unclean has ever passed my lips before, nor shall it ever. God says, shut up and have some ribs. They're good. Real good. Or ham. Or bacon. Sorry. Just getting you ready for lunch later. <laughs> but what's happening here is God is giving Peter a vision not just for his diet, but for his ministry. Because while Peter's doing his thing, there's this other dude named Paul running around to the Gentiles. Peter was one of the Jerusalem Christians. These Christians believed to a degree, to differing degrees, that in order to become a Christian, you first had to become Jewish. And that's why Peter and Paul butted heads so much. But God's saying to Peter, look, you got it wrong, pal. You're calling these Gentiles unclean, and I'm telling you that they are now part of the promise, and they are offered the redemption that was purchased through my son. This vision was a true vision to tell Peter, look, we're looking down the road here and I need you to get on board. You need to direct your path this way. And if we know anything from Peter, we know that he struggled with that a little bit. But that's a very human experience. Now, something to, to, to help you understand something, because... Um, how many of you have ever focused on what it says, on the, the fact that it says Peter fell into a trance? I thought about bringing out a pocket watch and saying, all right, everybody, watch the watch. And that tends to be where our head goes, because that's sort of what we think about, hypnosis or something like that. But I'm willing to bet that most of us in here have been in a trance before. You just didn't call it that. How many of you have ever been doing something and you got so lost in it that the world melted away? You were working on a project, you were reading a book, you were crocheting a sweater, you were playing some music, uh, you were working at your job, you're going for a run, you're doing something, but it's the kind of thing where everything melts away and somebody could have been talking to you for five minutes, you had a no clue they were even in a room. You guys ever experienced that? Somebody were watching you, what do you think they might call that? You were in a trance right? This sense of a trance comes when we are intently focused on what we're doing. What was Peter doing? Praying. And he was so focused on it and wanting something from God, trying to figure out who God's calling him to be, what God's calling him to do as this early church is starting off. And God responds with an answer. We call it a vision. 
this is part of our Christian journey. This is part of our Christian faith. They're all connected, and they all drive us deeper into relation with God. I've heard it said that prayer is us talking to God. Meditation is quieting our minds so we can hear God speak to us. Now, those are three kinds of meditation. But we're going to hit one more. I'm not going to ask you to participate in it because we've actually been doing it for the last 20 minutes. When we are visioning, when we are asking God, what do you want from me? If we get an answer, we also have to be discerning. Because it's tempting to hear my own voice and assume it's God's because I like the answer, right? Something that's really, really important to remember is if everything that, that I ask God to respond to happens to fit in with exactly what I want to do anyway, it is very likely that I am not trying to follow the God that created me. It's very likely I am creating a God that's in my own image, and that's dangerous. Discernment is trying to figure out what is God and what is genuine. We have a tool for that. It's not a foolproof tool, but it helps us whittle things down. Because what does Psalms tell us to do? Meditate on the law, on the Word of God. Because if we know the Word of God, it gives us at least a foundation to say, is this even okay with what God could call me to do? And if the answer is no, then we know that that's not, we're discerning that what we're hearing or feeling is not of God. We need to keep going back to the drawing board. And we do this in many different ways. We've just been doing it this morning. We've been meditating on Scripture, right, within a context. We do this in Bible studies. We do this in Sunday school. Some of us do this at home when we open our Bible and read our Bible. It's reflecting and contemplating on Scripture so that it gets in us, right? It's not just words on a page about what has happened in the past. What do we call Scripture? What kind of word is it? Dead? The living word, right? It's a living word that continues to speak to us even today, thousands of years after it was written. God is still using Scripture to guide and instruct, to nurture, to strengthen, to inspire us. But the only way that happens is if we take the time to meditate upon it. It's very hard if, if, if someone says, you know, what do you want to eat? And you say, I don't know. What do they have? And they say, well, read the menu. And I say, I don't feel like reading the menu. Then I wonder why I'm hungry. I'm on food this morning for some reason. Um, and it works in us differently. We're gonna have, I want to just introduce you to one more thing, and we'll, we'll, we'll sing our way out. Any of you ever heard of something called Lectio Divina? Okay. It's an ancient practice of meditating on Scripture, okay? And this is what it is. You read your Bible, and you pay attention to what verses jump out at you, right? Anybody ever notice when you read the same passage over and over again, sometimes depending on what's happening in your life, different passages in those jump out at you, right? So the sense is that with Lectio Divina, that when that happens, that's significant. That's God trying to speak something to us through the living word into our circumstances. And then for the next few days, what we do is we, we zone in on those verses. And we turn them over, and we read them, and reread them, and we think about them, and we pray about them. And, and when we seriously listen for what God is trying to speak to us through those verses surprisingly or unsurprisingly, many times, we hear God. It's kind of cool. And the whole point behind it, and this goes against what a lot of Christians think, is it goes the opposite direction. Lectio Divina isn't saying, you must read three chapters a day, because that's how you get yourself fed. Lectio Divina says, 
you know, start your week out or start a series of days out by reading Scripture until something hits you. And then dial into that manageable chunk. Right? Could you imagine trying to digest an, the entire book of Genesis at, at one time? It's not going to happen. But how about this? And God created man in his own image. Is that something you can chew on? Absolutely. can remember it, can repeat it, and let it sit and simmer over and over in our minds and spirits. This practice of meditation is not something to be afraid of. As Christians, if we go back to the earliest vestiges of our faith, it's something to be embraced. Because as we quiet ourselves to listen for God's voice, as we meditate on what God has already done, as we ask God, what do you have for the future, as we rely on God's word to help us discern what of that message is truly of God, it leads us more into the way. It helps us become more like Christ. It changes us. It changes what's within us. And how does the world change? How many people at a time? One. One person at a time. So start with ourselves. And then let God express God's self through us and help to transform the world.